Welcome to everyone coming on. We'll be starting in two or three minutes as a few more people get a chance to come in. Good to have you all here. Welcome everybody. We're going to ask you all to mute your sound when you come on so that we're able to hear as well as possible. We'll start in about two or three more minutes when people have a chance to come in and join. Let's see, we're 12.02. We'll give folks one more minute to come on. We've got a nice crowd already in. All right, I think we're able to start. My name is Phyllis Bennis. I run the New Internationalism Program at the Institute for Policy Studies. I'd like to welcome you all here this afternoon. This is an amazing uh, opportunity that we're gonna have today to hear from a dear friend of mine and a long-term colleague, comrade, running partner, co-conspirator, et cetera, of the Institute for Policy Studies and our sister institute, the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam, uh, Richard Falk. Richard, as many of you I'm sure know, is a noted professor of international law, 40 years at Princeton and more recently at my alma mater, UC Santa Barbara. Uh, he, was, he is one of the, the leading public scholars on international law and issues of how to go about challenging colonialism in the world. Uh, he served for six years as the UN's Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territory. And he has spent his very long life in a very wide range, a very broad assortment of political struggles, struggles for justice, particularly shaped by struggles against colonialism. Uh, defined by, his life has been defined really by engagement with those struggles from Vietnam to, uh, to Iraq, from Iran to Palestine and a number of countries beyond that. And his new memoir, which I really recommend for people, Public Intellectual, The Life of a Citizen Pilgrim, uh, a great title in many ways, uh, that not only describes Richard's life, but the movements with which he worked, the, the struggles that he has uh, supported over the years with great, um, not just memories, but descriptions of the work of a number of leading forces in so many of those struggles from our, my great mentor and, and Richard's great friend, Ekbal Ahmad, to people from, from all over the world. So there's a, a huge number of interesting anecdotes and stories about people that you've probably read about at some point, but may not have ever had the opportunity to, to, to know. So welcome, Richard. I'm really glad that you could be with us today to talk about your book. What we're going to do today is begin with some discussion between Richard and me. I'm gonna raise some questions uh, for Richard to, to take on within, uh, mainly within the, the context of the book, but perhaps a bit broader. And then about halfway through around 12.30, we're gonna bring on a couple of other interlocutors uh, Robin Broad from American University and Walden Bellow, the co-founder of the, the uh, of Focus on the Global South. 
and they will have some comments about Richard's book as well, and then we'll have some additional conversations, and we should be done in about an hour. So that's what we have to look forward to. So to start, Richard, in the section of your book that talks about Vietnam and your work, your extraordinary work in the, uh, in the anti-war uh, struggle in the US, a lot of the focus that you bring to that discussion and, and what was very much part of central to your work at that time had to do with the question of legitimacy and legality or illegitimacy and illegality of US actions beginning with the initiation of the war itself. And you focus a lot on the question of dealing with those illegalities and illegitimacies within the context of international law and the United Nations. At the time that most of your colleagues were, the, the faculty of Princeton at the time that you talk about, most of them that were progressive were working directly with the student movement. They were out in the streets. They were the sponsors of the student organizations. So I'm curious, you, you talk about it very briefly, but I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about why you decided to keep the focus of your own role in the, in the context of that giant rising movement on these questions of international law and the United Nations and legality, rather than choosing to be a more active part of the, uh, of the movement itself. Well, let me first say hi and great to be with you and see you after this long period of uh, geographic and social isolation. Um, uh, the question you pose is a really interesting one for me, and I think I don't do it justice in the book. Uh, I came to uh, the anti-war movement uh, by way of my interest in those issues you describe, uh, uh, a, a professional concern with uh, intervention in foreign societies. The, uh, I had a more naive trust in the relevance of international law to the foreign policy of powerful countries, including uh, my own, the US. And I uh, had the idea that one way of being uh, an activist uh, was to push the le legal argument, and which uh, really was a superstructure un uh, for a moral and political argument. And I was, uh, I've been a product of the so called Yale approach to international law, which uh, was less uh, positivistic or legalistic uh, than uh, most uh, uh, treatments of international law in both Europe and North America. Uh, so my, my sense of what I could contribute was much more based on this uh, professional credentials that others uh, chose not to rely on to enter the public debate about the uh, merits of the American policy toward uh, Vietnam. And uh, so it was a kind of natural pro uh, progression for me. And as I do try to explain in the book, my understanding of the war radically trans uh, was radically transformed by my visit to North Vietnam in the midst of the war, toward, toward, toward the end uh, in a certain way, although it was to go on for seven more years. This was 1968 when I went there and the American departure didn't occur till uh, 1975 in this humiliating way of leaving uh, Saigon that reminds us of what just happened in Afghanistan. Uh, and that's another story. But, uh, and what happened in Vietnam to me that was so profound in my own uh, uh, self-education uh, was the uh, 
understanding of what a high technology war meant when it was waged against a peasant society, which was had very limited technology and was um, really completely vulnerable to these uh, devastating uses of uh, this uh, high technology naval air and land uh, military superiority that America possessed. And later on, I was very struck and remain struck by the fact that despite this military superiority, the US lost the war. And, and the uh, failure to learn that lesson of why it lost the war has led to the repetition of the Vietnam experience in a series of countries, including Iraq and Afghanistan and many and several others. So this was a certain kind of uh, political and personal learning that informed my act activism and my understanding of what uh, was effective politics through the years. It's fascinating to think about when, as you say, we've just seen a, uh, a situation in Afghanistan where at least the optics were very similar to the U.S. pullout from Vietnam uh, in, in 1975, uh, the helicopter takeoff from the, the roof of the embassy and all of those sort of iconic moments, um, despite the fact that the nature of those wars was so different. The, the failure was so much alike and the, the US withdrawal was so, was so similar uh, in that way. It's a really powerful reminder of the failure to have learned any of these lessons about why wars fail uh, on the US side that, that you've sort of chronicled for, for so many years. And now in this book, you know, looking at one after another after another as if the, the prior failures had never happened. Um, Could I just say a word about uh, why this low level of learning hasn't occurred? And, and I think it's essentially because uh, the United States over the years since 1941, essentially, has been uh, constantly uh, prepared for war and uh, had an unusually high uh, so-called peacetime uh, defense budget. And uh, the result of that was a militarized state that can't think, uh, lost its political and moral imagination to conceive of how one addresses uh, foreign policy when there are conflictual issues, except through the use of military threats, coercive diplomacy, and warfare. And so interesting, we had a, a question that just emerged about sanctions, which of course are rising as a, a more common uh, weapon of war. They're certainly not an alternative to war, but a weapon of war. But it also raises this point about something you raised earlier about seeing international law and the potential for international law in a kind of moral framework. One of the challenges that we have faced now and that it, at IPS and our work with the, with the Poor People's Campaign and elsewhere, uh, where there's a lot of focus on the continuing reality of the US spending 53 cents of every federal dollar on the military. And even more, if you count the militarization budget, it gets up to like 62, 63 cents of every federal dollar that includes militarization of the border and all those things. And what that, what that does both to those countries that are the targets and at home where the money is somehow not available for jobs and healthcare and climate and all the issues that people in this country care about. So the need to include both access to that money at home for those important projects and the moral point of saying, we have to cut the military budget so that we don't keep killing people around the world. It seems that you're saying that the international law framework can somehow 
move in both those directions. Is that right? Well, that's what I had hoped way back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have that uh, confidence any longer. But what I do think is that it is indispensable to have a critique of the militarized state and, and the, the uh, transnational political class that is beholden to a kind of outmoded political realism uh, that believes still that history is made by the, by the side that has uh, the military, superior military capability. And if you look at all the major anti-colonial wars, they were won by the side that was militarily inferior. And uh, the, in the case of India, that was won by essentially soft power, not by uh, confronting the imperial power of uh, Britain. And that, that is the that insight is what is resisted by those that are uh, governing and advising those who are governing, because that political realism is wedded to this uh, militarization as the key to security and to uh, per the pursuit of uh, international goals uh, by the United States. Mm, yeah. You know, another, another sort of framework or fundamental component of international law that you focus on a lot in the book is the question of accountability. And it, it came up in a, in a very interesting way in your section about Iran and your work with both Iranian students in the US and the Iranian opposition to the Shah's regime uh, that, that was taking shape in the late 70s and early 80s. And this notion of accountability for human rights violations and the degree to which there isn't accountability uh, at the international level. Um, you, you quoted something in a meeting that you had with Ayatollah Khomeini before he was uh, the leader of the revolutionary forces when he was still in exile, when he talked about the U.S.-Iran status of forces agreement the, from 1945, 48, I think it had been signed, which the, in which the Shah had given the U.S. not only the right to station thousands of troops in Iran, but allowed them to be immune from any accountability to the Iranian legal system, so that there was no accountability if soldiers, as they often did, killed people in car accidents. There was just absolutely no accountability, as we've seen in, in so many countries uh, around, around the world. So I'm curious why, why you sort of focus on accountability as, as such a key issue in, in your analysis in so many different, uh, different countries. And also, if you could talk a little bit about how this lack of the US ever being held accountable in international jurisdictions, of course, also true of other powerful countries, but it's the most stark, I think, regarding the US, uh, whether it's the International Criminal Court, other special tribunals established by the UN, whatever, when the powerful countries are not brought up to the dock in, in The Hague or somewhere else, does it make more sense to keep fighting for legitimacy of those courts for those countries where terrible leaders themselves are held accountable, even when the powerful are not? Or does it make more sense to say we will not participate in courts like this until everybody is equally uh, accountable to those courts? It's, it's a longstanding debate within the movement for international law and the international criminal court system. I'm just curious how you come down on that, on that debate. Well, it's a uh, fundamental jurisprudential question that I've really given a lot of thought to over the years because uh, um, a real axiom of a legal order is to treat equals equally. And uh, even the UN was designed to treat equals unequally uh, as exemplified by giving 
uh, veto power to the five winners in World War II and uh, making them essentially non-accountable whenever their policy collided with either the norms of the charter or the preferences of a majority of the Security Council members. So the whole uh, international order that emerged out of World War II uh, embedded this contradiction that all sovereign states are equal and equally accountable, but some are much more equal than others. And the primacy of geopolitics was embedded in the UN itself. And that was deliberately reflecting two main uh, characteristics of uh, that period. The first was the sense that if you wanted the Soviet Union to participate, you had to give them a way of protecting them their interests against what was perceived to be a large majority enjoyed by the Western members. There were many Western members and a relatively small number of members of the so-called Soviet bloc. Uh, so that was one, feature, one reason. The other reason was that the uh, Franklin Roosevelt, among others, felt that the League of Nations failed because it excluded geopolitics from its uh, framework and its operations. And there was a sense, the optimistic sense, that if the wartime alliance against fascism uh, was so successful, there was no reason to think it couldn't endure in peacetime. You know, a great misconception. Uh, and so, and so the, the UN opted for this idea of universality of membership at the cost of sacrificing accountability of the powerful. And the Mexican delegate to the UN uh, was asked what he thought of the organization after its founding. And he said, we've created a great organization for holding the mice accountable while the tigers roam free. See, and that I think that is the design. It, it isn't just something that was a kind of sinister deviation from the legal system. It was embedded in the legal system. And so you have a very uh, suspect way of approaching accountability. It's also uh, embodied in what happened at the Nuremberg trials and where the crimes of the winners were exempt from scrutiny while the, and certainly most people, most of many people anyway, thought that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were crimes of the greatest severity, but they couldn't even be investigated because of this notion of victor's justice. So again, uh, illustrating this primacy of geopolitics, which has shaped international law since its founding, uh, which was for, as a vehicle for the expansion of capitalism, for the uh, legitimation of colonialism, and for uh, many other things that we now view as uh, crimes against humanity. I mean, in other words, what started uh, as the use of international law as a geopolitical tool has gradually engendered uh, forms of resistance, particularly by the Latin American countries that have to some extent uh, neutralize that aspect of international law, but they still have failed to effectively challenge this primacy of geopolitics. 
as we see in the United Nations every day with the, the permanent members that happen to be the same as the five legal nuclear weapon states uh, are the ones who have the veto, et cetera. Um, but I think we have time for maybe one more part of this discussion before we open it up for our other interlocutors to join. And that goes to the question of the United Nations and your role as the special rapporteur on human rights in the occupied Palestinian territory, uh, a position that you held from 2000, the end of 2008, I guess it was, uh, until 2014. And during those six years, I would say that you, you, on one hand, played your traditional role, the role you had played for so many years before, keeping your focus on the, your work as a, uh, an international law expert and academic with your writing, your reports. But even in that period, you had shifted so much. I, when we worked together during those years, uh, when you were drafting your reports, we talked about the importance of preparing them in such a way that they would be accessible to, uh, to social movements, the movements around the world that were fighting for Palestinian rights and the Palestinian movement itself, understanding that they wouldn't have as much influence in the official UN circles. Uh, and the, the role that you played, of course, went far beyond that in terms of of uh, taking on strategic questions within the Palestinian movement, the question of apartheid, where you, along with, with uh, Virginia Tilly, a, a colleague on a, a paper you drafted for one of the other UN agencies after your, your stint as special rapporteur, uh, actually helped create the notion of a, bro a much broadened definition of apartheid beyond the geographic uh, definition that apartheid takes place on a piece of territory where a, a unitary governing force uh, imposes two separate legal systems on a population divided by whether it's, it's race or language or whatever, to say that it's also, in this case, something that applies to Palestinian refugees wherever they are in the world, because it's something that should be defined by its impact on people rather than with a geographic specificity, which was a hugely important uh, um, development in one of the key strategic components of that of the Palestine movement. So you really moved into playing a much more kind of activist role, if you will, within that. And I'm curious why uh, why it was the Palestine struggle, particularly because it's the one where you got the most attacks, the most efforts at demonizing you and and uh, um, isolating you politically. Although luckily that never happened. Uh, movements came to your defense very powerfully. Um, but you paid a big price for that one. And I'm curious why it was that struggle out of so many struggles for justice that you've been involved with over the years that pushed you to take that broader activist um, position. Uh, well, a kind of a sort of flippant answer to that question would be uh, my friendship with uh, Edward Said and Iqbal Ahmed. Uh, they teased me about being so active in these other domains and uh, uh, sort of the power of shame uh, led me initially toward uh, a, a active engagement in the Palestinian issue. I had avoided it uh, for many years or semi-avoided it. I had written some things, but I, d I didn't uh, identified because I realized it was the third rail of American uh, politics and that once you touched it, you would be uh, uh, demonized in a, a variety of w unpleasant ways and rendered less effective generally. Uh, but I'm, I'm very glad I touched the third rail and uh, my experience at the UN was a mixed one. And it's not exactly true that the reports and the efforts to discuss colonialism and apartheid in the context of the uh, extended uh, uh, failure to find a sustainable peace for the Palestinian people, uh, it, it um, it, it was quite influential with 
uh, governments in the global south who didn't have the uh, information and the they re they relied to a surprising extent uh, on these reports uh, as a source of objective information about uh, why it was important to uh, seek a kind of uh, justice uh, in relation to the Palestinian people. Uh, Brazil was, uh, pre-Bolsonaro, Brazil was one example that I had direct contact with. Egypt was another and India was another. But, uh, but the, the more fundamental response to uh, what you suggested, Phyllis, was that I came to feel that the intergovernmental system was not capable uh, and was not uh, committed sufficiently to find a solution and that if there was to be a just and sustainable peace for both peoples, it would depend on civil society activism and mobilization. And in that sense, it would resemble the last stages of a South African apartheid, where it also seemed unlikely that you could exert sufficient pressure on this uh, uh, racist uh, regime to produce the result that occurred, which was its uh, more or less uh, negotiated dismantling and shift a rather peaceful transition to a constitutional uh, order that treated uh, its re residents equally uh, are on the, and the, on the basis of human rights. It, it's far from a perfect solution, but it was much, it, it illustrated to me what I've come to call the politics of impossibility. That is, it, 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 there was no reasonable way it could happen and, and one could anticipate it until after it occurred. And then uh, people like myself tell, uh, come along and explain why it had to happen. Uh, but, uh, and I feel that way about uh, the Palestinian struggle, that if civil society holds the key, it has the opportunity and the responsibility to bring sufficient pressure to change the Israeli elite understanding of its own self-interest, which is what happened in South Africa. There was no moral epiphany where the white elite woke up one day and said, we're doing the wrong thing. We shouldn't be keeping Mandela in prison. We shouldn't be uh, uh, pursuing an ideology of uh, white supremacy. They didn't do that. It was a pragmatic uh, adaptation to a change balance of forces brought about not by government, not by the UN, but by civil society activism. Yeah, I, absolutely. And I would just say, we're about to bring on our, our other two uh, guests and interlocutors, but I just wanted to say one thing, which is that I think your years as the special rapporteur, the reports that you did and the degree to which those civil society organizations both in Palestine and around the world, were able to use those reports and the, the, the basis for them, uh, has played a huge role in this country, in the United States, in what we've seen as really massive shifts in public and media discourse on the question. We are very far still from the policy shifts, but the initial work of changing the discourse that goes on among the population and in the mainstream media, as well as the progressive media, has been a profound shift. And your role within that um, has been a very powerful part. So thank you for that. As somebody who worked in that movement for a long time, I could see that, that shift uh, that was underway. And let me say one final thing about that briefly. Uh, Israel understands the importance of losing what I call the legitimacy war or the, uh, the battlefields within the domain of symbolic politics. And one should understand 
their branding of these Palestinian human rights organizations as terrorists as part of their panicked reaction to this buildup of pressure from uh, on a basis of human rights, international morality, international law, sense of fairness. Uh, a lot of factors have played into this. But Israel understands why South African apartheid collapsed. And they, they're on their side, they're determined not to let it happen to them. And so that's what the, dra the drama that is shaping up globally, in my view. I think that's absolutely right. It's fascinating how the Israelis, as, as you say, have learned the lesson of South Africa and are trying to prevent it from being applied to themselves. When in this country, the US has not learned any of the lessons of either its own or other examples of colonial powers losing and losing and losing, but with extraordinary high costs to the people of, that, of those subject countries. Uh, who have paid such an enormous price. I think we're gonna move on to our further discussion. Uh, Justin, can you bring on uh, Robin and Walden? I think we're um, just getting them back on screen now. Here is one and there is two. Uh, we have, great. So let me introduce our new guests who will be with us for the, the rest of our discussion today. Uh, Robin Broad is a professor at, hello, at American University. Uh, she's a recipient of a, of a Guggenheim Fellowship and she is most recently the co-author with John Cavana, the longtime executive director and now senior advisor at the Institute for Policy Studies of the extraordinary book, called The Water Defenders, How Ordinary People Saved a Country from Corporate Greed, published just this year about the struggle against mining in uh, El Salvador. And also with us is our old friend Walden Bello, who is an inter the international adjunct professor of sociology at SUNY Binghamton. Uh, he's the co-founder of the Bangkok-based research and advocacy organization Focus on the Global South, one of his recent books is Counter-Revolution, The Global Rise of the Far Right. And Walden is currently uh, running for vice president in the Philippines when he goes back in a, in a little bit. So we're gonna have some brief comments from each, from, from Robin first and then from Walden, and then we'll be back in discussion mode with Richard as well. So thank you both for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. It's both a joy and an honor to be here with you, with Richard and with Walden. Um, it feels a bit like being back in Richard's classrooms, except now I have a co-professor named Phyllis Brennan, Brennan, uh, Bennis. In any case, let me just say, I'm holding up the book here because no one's done it. Let me just say how impressive this nearly 500 page autobiography is. Um, and I want to begin by just thanking Richard for the ride along the, 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 last near, the, the last near century in which you take us in this book. It is um, indeed that the details you remember and recount are utterly remarkable. Um, I'm not gonna ask you how you remember them all, but it really is, is just fascinating. As listeners may, as Richard knows, but listeners may not, I don't become a part of Richard's trajectory, if you'll allow me to say that, until the fall of 1978. That was when I entered the then Woodrow Wilson School <coughs> graduate program after uh, my first year living in the Philippines. I was a research assistant of Richard's um, where I did research on, among other things, the Philippines for that permanent people's tribunal. Richard then chaired my PhD committee, and since then our paths have intersected in various times and spaces. So my remarks will largely focus on only, only, the last four and a half decades of Richard's life, or so, which, if my math is correct, is half of Richard's life and two-thirds of my life. So I'm going to make five remarks, brief remarks, for about one minute apiece. First of all, mentoring. Richard goes out of his way in this book to say he doesn't mentor. 
that is absolutely false. He, he does mentor. He just has a different paradigm of mentoring. I'm going to call it, to use Richard's lingo for another term, I'm going to call it mentoring from below. A key part of what, Richard, what you do, Richard, um, is that you create the space for your advisees to do what they want to do, and you protect them. It is somewhat ironic, as you recall in detail in this autobiography, you are not, shall we put it, necessarily the favorite of the powers that be at Princeton University, but you were renowned globally and your fame attracted students and Princeton benefited by that, from that. And so with that fame, you provided space for me and others to do the work we wanted to do as progressive activist scholars, whether or not Princeton University at the top or at the dean's level, whether they wanted that or not. Um, you tell a great tale in your book about protecting a student from a, a certain Princeton University professor. Um, I'm not going to tell the name because I want people to read your book. In any case, as you may recall, you did the same for me and I'm sure other people. While you quite liked my doctoral dissertation, my second committee member, a mainstream economist, well, to put it bluntly, quite disliked it. Um, and, but he was very junior, and you at that point were very senior and globally renowned, and you took him on. And I and others wouldn't be where we are today if it weren't for that, that mentoring and that protection. Second point, related to your mentoring, and something I think you don't really emphasize enough is not only did you connect with individuals around the globe, but you connected your fellow public intellectuals of all ages and all spaces. And that changed lives. It's not that you, just that you changed our lives, but those interconnections changed our lives. So I met Akbal Ahmed through you. I met Cora and Peter Weiss through you. And yes, indeed, I met my future husband, John Cavana, through you, who was also a research assistant of yours. I met Walden through you. Um, as you may recall, you, you said yes, as you always say yes, to Walden's request that you work on the Philippines, on the Permanent People tri Tribunal, um, only if I could do the research for that work. Thirdly, and briefly on the overall book, since, since you and Phyllis have talked about that so much and on your life thus far, this book is full of fascinating takes on key moments in history that you witness as an actor in that history. I'm going to repeat that, as an actor in that history. Indeed, as I read your book, I realized that you are one of the only few people I know who has combined the following four worlds, and I'm going to do this very briefly. You are a top-rate scholar. You've been there for your students as a mentor. You've been there for activists. And you've been there for numerous world leaders across the globe, including Nelson Mandela, a story I did not know till I read the book. Most of us would be proud to do well in any one of these four categories. You excelled in all of them. Fourth, briefly, one thing I think you don't stress enough in this book regarding your achievements and legacy is your whole globalization from below framework. Your understanding and acting on the reality that change must come from the grassroots, from organized civil society, from those at the front lines. I'm going to move on to fifth, given the time limits. Fifth, and, and something that feels very important for me to say to you, Richard, um, you finish your book not sure that you have the hope that you once had. But let me suggest to you that your uncertainty is indeed premature. Let me assure you that such hope is still found in the frontline communities who, as you well know, are the actors of your globalization from below. The Water Defenders, the Standing Walk Sioux, the Movement for Black Lives, the Resurgent Women's Movement, the climate youth movement blossoming around the globe and right now in Glasgow, and so on. And to end, if you allow me, Richard, I want to give you a gift. I want to gift you with some more hope. 
and let me thank you for the life you have lived so far. Let me thank you for the contributions that you have yet to make, as well as for this book, which as the cliche goes, is a must read for anyone who, for people who want to understand not only your path and your tra trajectory, but who also want to understand this critical moment in history. So thank you. Thank you, Robin. That was lovely. And Walden, you're back. Join us. Yes, I, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, um, I uh, of course, I'm very happy to um, be asked to be a commentator uh, in this uh, dialogue uh, for someone who really has been an inspiration to so many of us, you know, certainly to me. And um, and um, I uh, would just like to say a few words. Uh, uh, first of all, in in assessing um, where his uh, at or in in this range of people who have tried to make an impact uh, on the world, um, uh, Richard at some point said, you know that. He, you know, between those who have achieved recognized academic excellence and those who have achieved what he calls uh, positive uh, uh, public notoriety uh, because they were able to break the barriers or um, uh, basically went, um, um, you know, to, um, uh, recognition uh, because of their societal contribution. He said that he was in the demilitarized zone or the DMC between these two, um, between those who uh, achieved academic uh, recognition and those who made a breakthrough. Um, well, actually, uh, I think Richard is being quite modest because uh, he did make a breakthrough a very, very strong breakthrough. Uh, and, um, he, you know, he, he, he is one of the few people of his uh, academic and intellectual stature who called what Israel does uh, by its real name, which is apartheid. And, you know, as I said, maybe only one or two other people uh, have, have dared to do that. And uh, I think that is a great moral br breakthrough. And uh, for that, he has been subjected, as Phyllis said, to demonization uh, and so many other things uh, from the Israeli state, plus you know, its, 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 um, uh, its supporters. And um, so I, 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 I think that, therefore, I think I would say that he joins Noam Chomsky, Dan Berrigan, and others, uh, you know, that he admires uh, in this category of people who have made, you know, that uh, moral breakthrough, uh, which has been very inspiring. Now, related to that, I would just like to say that precisely because Richard has been so stubborn in holding on to this uh, definition of Israel, you know, as an apartheid state, uh, the views that he has uh, uh, has, in fact, um, you know, become more widely circulated, more widely accepted. So the the, the sort of paradox that, um, because of the way that Israel came down on him, and, and you, Phyllis, um, this idea that that Israel is um, is an apartheid state is now more widely accepted. So it's like, um, it's amazing, you know, that, that, that because of his insistence on that, that has made that view much more accepted, contributing to the illegitimacy of the Israeli state at, at, at this point in time. Uh, so uh, that's the first thing that I would just like to say. Now, the, 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 
the second thing is this is such a multidimensional book that that touches uh, so many aspects of Richard's personal life, his political life, and the way that he tries to bring all those together. And in the process, he uh, has us meet so many of the people that have impacted on his life. As Robin said, Nelson Mandela and so many other, Dan Berrigan. Uh, and it's, you know, you meet the people who made a big difference uh, in the last uh, half century uh, and Richard's interaction uh, with them. Uh, he, um, some of the things that comes out and, and I, I did a review of the book, so I'm, I'm sort of uh, touching on some of the things I said. There were three lessons that I think comes out in this book that Richard draws on, uh, you know, in terms of um, what he has learned from life. One, I think is, he was very self-conscious. Uh, this is great, you know, uh, about the fact that um, a certain level of class comfort, material comfort, um, you know, where he came from, uh, class-wise, uh, you know, was was something important that he did not have to worry about having to be deprived materially uh, for the many controversial stance that he took. Uh, he's quite conscious that 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 comes that came from a being in a position of relative material comfort the class came from. So that self acknowledgement uh, is sometimes something that others uh, do not even are not even conscious of uh, that uh, that this is the reason that they can take on certain stands that are controversial uh, because they do not have to materially suffer from it. Uh, well, Richard, I think, recognizes that. And I think that's that a really good, a good thing. The second is his theory of where change comes from. That is that it comes from below. It, disruption comes from below. And what do you do as a person in Richard's position of being an intellectual is, you know, that one, you have to midwife such disruptions. And once they occur, you want to create legal and political orders, you know, that institutionalize, uh, you know, this so that they become uh, um, um, uh, factors that that advance the cause of deprived and marginalized people because they become institutionalized. The third thing I think that uh, 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 that I think is very important that Richard draws from is that. Um, you do not just focus on um, what Isaiah Berlin calls negative liberties. You do, do not just focus on deprivations of traditional civil democratic values, but you have to also bring about, recognize positive liberties, you know, which is you know, the creation of conditions that allow people to fill, fulfill themselves as human beings. Uh, and um, I, I think that this is something that traditional liberals are very skeptical usually about uh, positive liberties because they associate that with um, infringements on negative liberties. So Richard, therefore, um, uh, you know, very important in what he says is that, hey, you can both value China for what it has done, which is to uh, reduce the poverty rate very radically. And that's extremely important. Um, at the same time that you can be critical of its treatment of the Uyghur minority. And that uh, I don't see that Richard sees this as a contradiction. Uh, and um, whereas others would, would see that as a contradiction. So I think that is um, uh, extremely uh, important. And uh, finally, I just want to say that Richard is very frank, uh, even about his own contradictions. Um, and I, I think when he comes to um, discussing the whole question of Turkey, which is his adopted homeland and uh, uh, Hillel's, his wife's um, homeland, uh, it, it's very interesting how he deals with this. Is frank about you know the the situation there, how he reacts to it, and um, doesn't 
you know, doesn't uh, hold back uh, anything. So uh, I just wanted to end by saying that this is, a, a, you know, Richard gives us a very frank statement of his life, uh, tries to work out the relationships between the personal and the political. Uh, he really doesn't hold back anything, but of course the, the editor told him to uh, uh, take out a hundred thousand words and maybe, you know, uh, so, uh, so maybe he has more to say, uh, but uh, I think the frankness of this uh, memoir is, is great. So he doesn't basically, he, he makes it very easy for his biographers because they don't have to search and dig for the gems that make, you know, hidden things that make biographies a sparkle, you know. So he's made it very easy for his biographers because he doesn't hold back on anything. And, and I think uh, I would just like to say, uh, you know, this is the way that memoirs should be written, you know, really being self-reflective and very frank about what you've done. So thank you, Richard. It's a great memoir. And I do hope that more people uh, will, um, will really uh, get hold of this book because uh, it's both very illuminating about what it says about the interaction of an individual like Richard with the um, late 20th century and early 21st century, but also because it's a, it, it provides a method on how to do memoirs. Uh, an example of a good way of doing memoir. So thank you, Richard. And my best to heal out. Thank you, Walden and Robin. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Richard, for whatever responses you have. I would just add to Walden's last point with our thanks that you, you not only pose a model of how to write a memoir, but a model of how to be a public scholar, how to be an activist scholar. Uh, there's not a lot of models out there for most people who don't have the lucky opportunity to meet one or more who become their mentors. And this will make it possible for you to become a mentor to a whole new generation of public scholars. So thank you for that. But let me turn it back to you. I'm going to see if we can go just maybe a minute or two longer than our hour, but it's up to you, Richard. Well, I'm very moved by all three of you, what you said, uh, I, it reminded me of a lecture I heard years ago from the uh, founder of this uh, uh, school of uh, psychology at Santa Cruz, Norman O. Brown, who was very popular for a while. And he said, the only thing that's valuable in, in psychoanalysis are the exaggerations. And uh, uh, I heard with uh, great uh, satisfaction uh, th these three people whom I love and have known for decades uh, be so graciously generous in their assessment of my life and uh, the attempts I've made, which uh, I really, uh, in a way, don't deserve much credit for uh, what, uh, what has evolved, because I really uh, didn't think of myself ever as creating mo a model or of, uh, as Robin said, uh, being a mentor for others. I mean, I always felt I learned more from my students than they learned from me. And um, it, it was, um, as I also tried to say in the memoir, a privileged life that I was given uh, uh, after a troubled childhood and uh, a good deal of luck along the way. Uh, and I think that doing, uh, doing what you enjoy and what you believe in is really a precious gift 
and it allows you, I think, to um, uh, grow older in in a way that doesn't lead age to be such a great impairment, uh, especially if you're uh, reasonably lucky with health. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, Robin's last words about the uh, that hope lives, or hope should, hope is alive in the uh, progressive and, and uh, movements around the world that are making a difference. And as I tried to say in reference to the politics of impossibility, you don't uh, understand the potency of these. Uh, progressive uh, movements until after they've achieved their success. And they're often discounted. There's the famous Gandhian phrase, you know, first they laugh at us, then they fight us, and then we, then we win. Uh, that's probably misquoted, but uh, it's the spirit of it was... Uh, more or less there. And, and uh, I continue to be animated by, by that uh, underlying faith. And uh, people sometimes ask me, why do I keep uh, uh, writing and doing these things when the world is going in such different directions? And my answer is basically that uh, we should understand from any kind of reflection on the history of the last century uh, to have the humility of radical uncertainty that what we believe in can happen and therefore we have the responsibility to help make it happen. Thank you for that, Richard. It's, it's a great note to leave us on, I think for everybody on the call and everybody who listens later to take away that notion of radical humility that you express so powerfully and the radical part being so crucial, being willing to take risks and to support justice, whatever the, the consequences may be. You've modeled that for several generations now and we are grateful. So thank you. Thank you all for participating. Thank you all for joining us here today. I urge you to go out and buy Richard's book. It's an extraordinary uh, storytelling through the last century and the first half of this one, the first third of this one, I suppose. Uh, and thank you all. And we look forward to future events again. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis, for organizing this. Bringing us Thank you, together. Richard. Thank you, we'll Richard. Talk soon. Thank you, Richard. Thanks all. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Richard. Love you guys. Stay well so we can see you again sometime soon, Richard. Love Good. to Halal too. Yeah. Good. Yeah, will do.